Hi, this is Rhonda Jones, and I'm inviting you to the place. I don't know what else to say. When reasonable people uh, can't form these groups, when we can't have somebody that, it, that, that can simply come to the microphone and give a reasoned argument in a, in a civilized way and be a, a Carl Sagan kind of presenter, you know, because, because they, get, they, they, they face this kind of resistance, right? Who steps up in their stead? right you end up with the more antagonistic the more in your face firebrand atheists and people want to complain that people like me exist i understand that i am an extremist but i was forced into this position i would rather that softer spoken more intelligent and better speakers could take my place but the, the environment is as you said it doesn't permit that it has to have us come in first to be more in your face and more confrontational and take the brunt to allow the better people to rise. The idea that uh, Aaron just expressed here, uh, uh, sort of the need for the bulldogs and the firebrands and uh, you know, the people that are as forceful in, in their personality and, and uh, I mean, Aaron is the type of person that is accused of, of being strident, but I mean, he's right. You really do need people who will create elbow room. You know, they get in there and, with their elbows and they push people aside and they create space. And they create space for people like a girl in her teens who probably weighs 100 pounds, um, who is easily uh, intimidated. And actually, I, she's no wallflower. I mean, it took a lot of courage, a lot of pluck to go up against the school administration repeatedly. That, that's not a little thing that she did, that she accomplished. Um, you know, but. Uh, so yeah, we do need uh, people out there who sort of uh, lead the charge, um, and they do create space uh, and create opportunities for people who want to then come in and who will seem a little less strident and uh, more palatable to to people who, uh, you know, because there's just a lot of people who are sort of put off by by a strident message. Uh, so I anyway, thank you, uh, Aaron, for making that point. I thought that was uh, it needed to be said. Dr. Jones has been using this analogy of a ball inside of which we have access and outside of which we don't. And this ball lesson that he's using tries to talk about what it is we can know about what's inside that ball and what it is we cannot know about what is outside that ball. Now, I don't think that his analogy proves anything. In fact, that's its point. The point is that there is nothing that can be proven about what is outside the ball in this analogy that he uses. I think it's a very good one. I think it's one worth considering. And yet when he has given it, I found that a lot of people want to push back on it. But why? Is it because they have rational reasons for doing so? I say no. I say that they're too deeply invested in a position that is threatened by this analogy. They are not willing to consider another paradigm. And in spite of the fact that people often like to think of themselves as clear thinking, as open to really uh, uh, great ideas that possess a great deal to commend them, I find that it's not really true. I find that sometimes it's not even really true for me. And that people tend to hold on to the paradigms that they are satisfied with and refuse to consider another paradigm that might actually be equally plausible to the paradigm they hold on to. You see, paradigms don't need to be proven wrong in order for you to switch paradigms. Paradigms can also coexist that might be mutually exclusive, but where both of them seem to have a goodness of fit and we find ourselves in a conundrum. That can happen. But a lot of people don't like to do that. Rather, instead of being truly scientific or truly uh, rational, we tend to be socio-political. We tend to get invested into a paradigm and we don't switch until, until we're good and ready to as a result of some sort of a crisis that paradigm represents for us. This is true of the history of science. In fact, there have been many times, as Thomas Kuhn points out, where science was revolutionized by some insight and discovery. And the initial reaction to that will be resistance. 
but eventually that new insight will take over. But it doesn't do so by persuading people that, oh, this new paradigm is correct, and the old one is not. The way it works is that younger people, not invested in any paradigm, hear the two and they consider them and they latch on to the new insight, whereas the old people deeply invested in the old paradigms fight on to the death and die out. That's what really happens. We're not as open to new ways of thinking as we may think we are. And that's true of all of us, including me. And so I think that this is an excellent concept. I think you should take a look at it. And I think you should, while taking a look at it, take a look at yourself and see if you have the courage, the courage to be multi-axial, to entertain two very mutually exclusive paradigms as both having a particular possibility. And maybe we'll find out something about how dogmatic we can be when we don't think we're being dogmatic. After all, the definition for being dogmatic is not an honest one many times. Many times, the definition for being dogmatic is when somebody, for reasons I can't understand, insists on something I don't agree with. So, take a look at this ball that Dr. Jones is talking about and see if you can pick up on the lesson he's trying to teach. See what it says. Tell me what you think. Things out of the ball we'd have to do inside of it. <laughs> now, Greg, one last question. Which ball do you like best? Big drop. Uh, by, by far the bigger one. Far more so you, you're, you're for the big ball. Okay. <laughs>